Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 24, How Trump Stole 2020, featuring Greg Palast. Greg Palast is an investigative journalist who has reported for The Guardian, BBC Television, Democracy Now!, Rolling Stone, and more. In 2001, he exposed how Florida was stolen from Al Gore, and since then, one of his main focuses has been voter suppression in the United States. On this topic, he has few peers and has unearthed numerous scandals that deserve greater attention. Mr. Palast's new book, How Trump Stole 2020, The Hunt for America's Vanished Voters, was released this week and is available at gregpalast.com. I was fortunate enough to receive an advanced copy from Seven Stories Press, so I had a chance to read it before this interview. We discussed the moneyed interests behind voter suppression, including the Koch brothers, Paul the Vulture Singer, Georgia Pacific, the logging company, and Georgia Power, the utility. The gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, how exit polls showed widespread voter suppression in 2016, the problems with mail-in voting, and how voter suppression is class war. At the end of our conversation, he extends an offer for how to get the audiobook for free if you purchase the hard copy during this first week of release. One clarifying note, Mr. Palast talks to me here as though I'm an official staff member of CounterPunch, even though I'm merely an unpaid contributor. I didn't intend for him to get that impression, but that explains how he talks to me in a couple of instances. I got a, a copy of your book from Seven Stories, and I got a chance oh, to read it ahead of time Fantastic. already. And a great. lot of it, I already recognized some of the information from previous writing of yours. But it was amazing to have it all together in one place. And the scope of the theft and the graft is just breathtaking, honestly. Yeah, and that's one of the things that makes it difficult, too, because it's, you know, my fellow journalists don't want to look at the numbers of the actual vote theft. You know, they, they, they stop short of going after the real information and the numbers because it's so shocking. And I mean, that's kind of the $64,000 question, isn't it? I mean, why is it that not only the media, but also the democratic establishment, you know, basically ignores this scandal? Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. So the, yeah, the, the real question is that you asked, in a way, two questions. Where is the media? Where are the Democrats? Right. Whoa. Okay. Number one, um, the media is there, just not the American media. Remember, Greg Palast is a um, reporter for The Guardian, a British paper, and uh, and I was BBC television investigative reporter. When I first got into this topic, I was living in London. So the story that, that George Bush had stolen Florida because I – my investigation uncovered that they had removed tens of thousands of black men from the voter rolls before the election of 2000. That's in the book. They said they were criminals who couldn't vote. You know, you've got a, at the time in Florida, if you had a record, you couldn't vote. And uh, it turns out their only crime was voting while black. There wasn't a single ex-con on that, in that pile. Okay. So there's a ten, whole, a whole list of people right. were getting rid of them because they're About, felons, but then they're not. Yeah. Yeah, about 58,000. And I know that they're black because it says BLA next to their name in the voting records. I'm the only journalist that actually asked for the, for the list. Wow. All these other, all these other um, uh, stations like CBS and the Palm Beach Post, all these were saying, oh, oh, look, they're removing. Yeah, they found all these ex-cons on the votes. Well, some of it is that, you know, no one actually asked for the list. I did. And I found out and I contact people and then, then we started contacting going through the list and finally went to the attorney general and said, no, not one of these people is an illegal voter, but they were guilty of voting while black. Now, why am I bringing up that story from 20 years ago? The answer is two reasons. One, yeah, that story was on the front page of virtually every newspaper and the planet. And at the top of the nightly news, I put it at the top of the BBC nightly news, everywhere on the planet except 
the United States. It like bounced off the electronic Berlin Wall. So when people say, how come your stuff isn't in the mainstream press? It is. The New York Times is not the mainstream press. That's a backwater press. The mainstream is The Guardian and BBC. These are worldwide, world standard news outlets. In America, you're kept in the dark. Thank God for Counterpunch, by the way. <laughs> um, and that's important because what we call alternative news in America is the news in the rest of the world. Now you get to that other group called the Democrats. Oh, my God. So um, there is a chapter in How Trump Stole 2020 called Silence of the Democratic Lambs. And it's everyone's guess who um, – anyone's guess who you know uh why the democrats don't defend democratic voters well let's let's say which democratic voters it's not just anyone that's losing their vote if you read the book this is about jim crow this is the new sophisticated jim crow operation the democratic party does not defend voters of color you say yeah but it's their voters they don't defend voters of color there's all kinds of reasons and one of them by the way is simply the current Democrats wouldn't be in charge of the party. They would lose their primaries, you know. And so would you ha you would have a very different Democratic Party. Don't forget, while while the Democratic Party supposedly loves Stacey Abrams, the African-American, the first African-American woman ever to run for governor of a state, they didn't love her when she ran. They, they The Democratic Party tried to block her. Uh, so you have a very, Democrat, di very different Democratic Party. Uh, if if black people and and Af and brown people and Asian Americans and young people were allowed to vote, and actually, and then I have another chapter. Uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, I, I was talking with Noam Chomsky last night, and uh, his favorite chapter. He was he's read the book like twice. <laughs> uh -huh, great, <laughs> Noam. And uh, his favorite chapter is California Reman, which is about the theft of. The, this last primary, That's a, by the way, that's how fresh the book is. I just finished the book four weeks ago. Very unusual for, to go straight into publication. So it has the Democratic Party of this past, of just March, uh, from a couple months ago. And I calculated very carefully. I used to teach statistics, and I went and talked with the top statisticians. I went through the records. Bernie Sanders was shafted out of over half a million votes. And so this is what Chomsky was, was – um, um, focusing on was that the democratic party has their hands dirty too they have voter blood on their hands and therefore it's pretty hard to call out a, it's pretty hard for one thief to call out another thief and while it's true that the that the, the republicans stole the white house the democrats have simply the white democrats have simply stolen their party and the right wing democrats the corporate democrats have stolen their party from their own voters that's what's going on there. So, so we have a, a see no evil media. We have a Democratic Party, which will allow the theft of the White House as long as they can keep control of their own party. So you've got some, you know, this is the type of thing I'm busting. I'm not a partisan. I'm, I'm nonpartisan. I'm a, you know, I'm a writer. I, it's, I wrote tw How Trump Stole 2020. It's not partisan. It's a fact. He stole it. I'm also telling you how you can steal it back, so it's not it's not a prediction. It's it's a fact. Now we have to undo that fact to let the voters pick the president, a new concept in America. Right. You also I appreciated how you looked at the money behind some of this, and that was what I hadn't really quite caught before, which you're talking about. It's mm -hmm. uh it's the Koch brothers, right? That's how you pronounce their last name? K O Koch, yes. Koch, okay. I hadn't yeah. known about German. <laughs> Part, right. I, yeah. I hadn't known about the connection between the Koch brothers and the uh, 2013 Supreme Court case, which brought down part of the Voting, Voting Rights Act. Yeah, thank you. And that's why I appreciate Counterpunch. You guys follow the money. And you're with the, actually one of the first people to bring this up. Well, I should say Amy Goodman and Noam Chomsky did bring up the money, too, as they would. But um, – yeah, so it's always it, – look, you don't steal votes to steal elections. You steal votes to steal the money. This is vitally important. Now, for example, um, we heard that the, the Koch brothers were never Trumpers. Remember, they actually opposed Trump in 16. So where did Trump get his money? And remember, 
as I say in How Trump Stole 2020, um, uh, Donald Trump is not a billionaire. You know, my background is in economics and finance. I can tell you that for absolute certain. Donald Trump is not a billionaire, but he plays one on TV. Well, so he's a glove puppet billionaire. But whose fingers are in the gloves? And that's what I was trying to lay out also in the book to follow the money. So, for example, while the two Koch brothers were never Trumpers, uh, David and Charles, the third brother, Billy Koch, was the first billionaire to put in really big bucks to for the Trump campaign. Now, Billy Koch, the, the third and rarely noted Koch brother, who is um, uh, worth about $7 billion, okay? Um, as I note in the book, he used to get a little bit on the uh, little tipsy and call up a reporter, me at the guardian in London and rat out his brothers, David and Charles Coke on all their crimes, felony crimes in detail. I had my tape recorder on, you'll get some of that in the book, but why does Billy Coke need to buy a president? Because none of the Koch brothers are Republicans, just so you know this. They're all libertarians. They don't trust the Republican Party. They're not. So why would they support a Republican? Because they want the money. Uh, Billy Koch needs the, needed the XL pipeline because he runs a company called Oxbow Carbon. That's what he owns. Oxbow Carbon is the filth champs of America. They take, car- the, they take the carbon sludge out of the XL pipeline, right? It's taking tar sands oil from Canada down to Texas. By the way, think about that. Why do we need a, a, a pipeline to Texas, which has a bit of oil? It's drowning in oil from Canada. So you have to take the tar out of the pipeline uh, so that it will flow all the way down to Texas. Who gets, what do you do with the tar? It dries out. It's this filth that becomes petroleum coke, which is like a coal made out of oil sludge it's so filthy you can't burn it in america but you burn it in china and you still warm the planet um billy coke needed this planet destroying stuff because he owned he takes the coke uh the from the from the the pet coke from the xl pipeline trump was hostile to the xl pipeline just so you know because it is after all foreign oil coming into america but he became a lot less hostile when he got a big big check from Billy Coke. So I'm glad you brought up the money. You're the first guy to bring that up. So it's really what you're saying here is that it's not, you know, to look at it, this in terms of ideology is the wrong way to look at it. You know, we need to right. Uh, Yeah. It also stood out for me uh, when you mentioned Georgia Pacific, the logging company, because I spent a good amount of time in the Pacific Northwest. And so Mm -hmm. was involved in forest defense out there. And so, you know, Georgia Pacific, uh, they're one of the people on my hate list, you know? (laughs) Well, there you go. That that now Georgia Pacific is a very important player in this story because a lot of the story, the theft of the 2000, uh, the 2020 election was taken for a test drive in Georgia in 2018 when under 2018 Supreme court decision allowed Brian Kemp, the secretary, then the secretary of state of Georgia to wipe out, to purge the voter rolls of half a million voters, half a million. Now understand He's wiping out half a million voters while he is running for governor of Georgia, even though Wall Street Journal said it was unethical. He removes half a million voters. Golly gee, whose voters does he remove? An awful lot of voters of color. Uh, once again, I'm the only journalist that actually said, I want that those lists. He wouldn't give them. I sued him in federal court. I won in federal court, got the list, went through them and found out. With the with top experts, we went name by name using a very sophisticated computer program, um, and we proved that 340,134 voters had been wrongly removed. A third of a million voters. Now that's one state. Now remember, we were you were talking about Georgia Pacific. How does this come up? Um, so they illegally removed a third of a million voters. Uh, Brian Kemp. Now, who's behind Brian Kemp for governor? Who's, you know, vote thieving is not cheap. Who's behind this trickery? Well, Georgia Pacific. Who is Georgia Pacific? Georgia Pacific is your toilet paper company. They clear cut uh, pine forests for pulp. 
and turn it into toilet paper. They have a gigantic building in, in Atlanta. Why do you need a gigantic 40-story office building to sell toilet paper? The answer is that the toilet paper is the cover-up. It, that's just, <laughs> the toilet paper is on the outside. On the inside, it's Coke Industries. David and Charles Coke own, George, own Georgia Pacific. Now, uh, David has, has – the devil needed um, uh, another financier. So uh, it's only Charles left. And he owns Georgia Pacific, and they and Georgia Pacific could not have Stacey Abrams as governor because they need to clear cut. And and um, Stacey Abrams, the the uh, the black woman running for governor, said, "No, we're not going to destroy, eat Georgia alive, so you can turn it into toilet paper." Coke Industries, also hidden behind the toilet paper, wanted to drill offshore in the Gulf. Uh, this is post Deepwater Horizon, like we've learned nothing. And again, Stacey Abrams was against this. Stacey Abrams was also against um, spending billions of dollars to com- complete an completely insane nuclear power plant in Georgia. Uh, Georgia, that's Georgia Power. Georgia Power needed billions of dollars from the public to finish this crazy nuclear plant, which would, you know. Uh, raise electric rates for the average Georgia family by about 300 bucks a year. Now, Stacey Abrams said no. So Georgia Power had to go out against her. Again, I'm I'm explaining. It's not that they had to stop a black woman. They had to stop a candidate who said no to offshore drilling, no to clear cutting, no to nuclear plant. It's a, So the elites of Georgia got together and said we got to stop this woman, but they had a problem. There weren't enough white guys to elect Brian Kemp as governor, so they had to remove the non-white guys. Same with Agent Orange, our president. There's not enough white guys to re-elect him or to have elected him in the first place, so they got to remove the non-white guys. And But you have gotten to the heart of it. It wasn't about – they weren't stopping Stacey Abrams or Hillary Clinton or any other person because of race. They were doing it for the money. Race is merely the weapon because it's easy to wipe out black voters. Who's going to raise their voice? Right. And so one way in which they did this was that because a lot of these things would have been illegal, well, were illegal before the Voting Rights Act was gutted in 2013. And so oh, you you yes. tell the story of how that case got brought to the Supreme Court and that the Koch brothers were behind that as well. Yes, you have to understand Shelby – okay, the case that destroyed the Voting Rights Act in 2013, and people have to understand 2016 was the first presidential election we had kind of post-Voting Rights Act. Without that case, Trump would not be president, all right? So who brought that case? Shelby, Alabama. Where does little Shelby get the millions and millions and millions of dollars to back this, to back this court case? They got it from – Donors Trust, which is a cutout for the Koch family interests. And um, so it was Koch money behind taking apart the Voting Rights Act. And he did that in coordination with a guy called Paul the Vulture Singer, a guy I've been investigating. I flew to the Congo to investigate this guy. I flew to South America. I flew to the Arctic. I've been hunting this guy all over the planet. He's not called the vulture because of his of his friendly business practices. The vulture is a vicious marauder, financier marauder, whose activities are illegal in most of the world. Thank, I will actually take a bow here. I uh, after I did some investigations of him, laws are passed in England, Germany, China. To stop this guy, but not in the United States because he bought himself a political party called the Republicans. He got George Bush to back off um, taking action against him. And so but on the other hand, God forbid a politician he didn't buy gets elected. So Paul the Vulture Singer uh, through his his um, uh, hit squad called the Manhattan Institute, his supposed think tank. He was another one. Pushing both legis- pushing legislatively to stop the um, uh, the uh, the Voting Rights Act from being voted back into law. Understand what the Supreme Court did? It 
it gutted the Voting Rights Act, but it did say Congress has the right to restore it. And Congress didn't restore it. Why wouldn't Congress restore the Voting Rights Act? Paul the Vulture Singer. So right. you're right. Follow the money. And this was under Obama's presidency when the Voting Rights yeah. Act was gutted. And one could call this ironic that under the, the office of the first black president that this important piece of civil rights legislation was gutted. Well, it's not just ironic. It's the reason. I mean, uh, now, Obama was hardly a threat to the ruling elite. No, not but at on all. the other hand, if Obama could be elected, if Obama could be elected, um, you know, God knows Bernie Sanders could be following next. Plus, even let's not forget Hillary Clinton, while her hubby deregulated the finance markets, Hillary Clinton was uh, saying that uh, they have to uh, begin reversing some of that deregulation. Uh, so even someone as as corporate right wing as Hillary Clinton, even she was a threat to several powers, including and, – and so that's why they have to put in – they have to prevent – by gutting the Voting Rights Act, they changed everything within hours. And I'm not talking days or months. Within hours, Alabama, Tennessee, and other states passed all these vicious Jim Crow laws. Within hours, they went into effect when the Voting Rights Act was gutted. And – we're not – and that's one of the things I'm trying to bust here. And again, but you're right about one thing. It's like, well, where are the Democrats on this? They're saying, oh, what a shame. But um, you know, even the Obama presidency was not exactly on the front lines defending the right of, of black people to vote. But here's the thing, and I will say you know, I don't agree with this philosophy, but when I was writing for Rolling Stone, um, we did call Obama. He's very knowledgeable about – how the votes are being stolen. But his view was just overwhelming. Uh, my, by my calculation, how Trump stole 2020, 7.8 million votes, 5 million votes were not, never counted, and 2 to 3 million voters were blocked from the voter rolls, at least. In 2016. In 2016. Mm -hmm. Well, all you have, uh, what Obama would say is overwhelming. We calculated, by the way, in my book, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, I had a very clear – I used to teach statistics, so I, I, you know, I broke it down from U.S. government records. I don't make this stuff up. It comes from U.S. government records, U.S. Elections Assistance Commission, other agencies actually calculate the non-votes in America. And we had – Obama was cheated out about 5.9 million votes. And his answer was, well, we just overwhelm it. We just overwhelmed it. We will overwhelm it. That's, that's his view. But there's so many more votes that have been suppressed since then. I, I mean, there's a point at which it is virtually impossible to, quote, overwhelm it. 7.8 million votes and voters. You combine the voters that were blocked from voting with the votes that don't get counted. 7.8 million votes were taken away from Hillary Clinton. Whatever you think of her, she was elected president, and I'm not talking about the popular vote. I'm talking about in the Electoral College, if you go to Wisconsin, to Michigan, to Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Arizona, if you look at the exit polls she won, I have a whole chapter, the red shift is coming. The exit polls are what the U.S. State Department used to determine what the real vote is in a nation. And that applies in every state. We didn't recognize the governments of Ukraine, of Peru, of Serbia, because the exit polls conflicted with the final count. Well, that's true in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, my friends. Donald Trump didn't win. And But I give you how that happened. Because when people tell an exit pollster, when people tell an exit pollster um, that, um, oh, I voted for Hillary, I voted whatever, they don't know if their vote was counted. And here's a nasty little secret, which you got in the book, How Trump Stole 2020. The nasty secret is that we don't count all the votes in America. According to the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission, which tracks it, 1.9 million ballots cast in precinct were disqualified for all kinds of cockamamie technical reasons. 1.9 million votes. Now, if it's random, who cares? But Trump only won by three states by 70,000 votes. According to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, which you know from the book, is that the chance of your vote being disqualified, mismarked, read, you know, um, the machine couldn't read it, 
is 900% higher if you're black than if you're white. By the way, the main reason for that is bad machines in African-American and um, neighborhoods. They give you crappy schools and crappy hospitals and crappy police, if not worse. You're going to – you're not – you're still going to get crappy machines. And in fact, and then I'll, I'm sorry, I'm filibustering, but I'll do the, the last bit. It, the chapter on Michigan, Michigan, Michigas, where I go fly to Detroit for democracy now. And Trump wins that state by 10,000 votes, 10,700 votes. 75,000 votes, 75,355 ballots to be exact, were never counted. Where? Mostly Detroit. Why? Again, crappy voting machines. The machines broke down. The vote scanning machines broke down. You vote on paper in Michigan, but it's put through a scanner. The scanners were broken in Detroit. Why? Because the state, Republican state officials, refused Detroit's please, the begging by the city clerk of Detroit, please give us new machines. We these machines we have in Detroit are broken. They're old. They won't make it. They won't count the votes. And the Republicans, the Republicans in control of the city, it was bankrupt then, so the GOP had control from the state, said, oh, black votes won't be counted? What a shame. So 75,000 black ballots were not counted. That's how Trump won Michigan in the presidency. Now, you take that nationwide, 75,000 votes lost in Michigan, 1.9 million votes, again, according to the government, mostly voters of color. That's what's happening. It's race. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... I've been following this, this, you know, your work since before 2016. Mm -hmm. And so I've been seeing these numbers and I've been quoting the 75,000 number in in Detroit to anyone who will listen, you know, (laughs) since then, (laughs) you know, being that that Trump only lost that state by 10,000. I mean, it, it is truly astounding to me. And then on top of that, you know, we then have like, oh, these polls just came out that, you know, Biden is ahead of Trump or whatever. And it's like, they talk about these polls and talk about these numbers as if they're real numbers. And I'm like, yes, but none of these are real numbers. The whole game is entirely rigged and entirely fixed. And how can we have these conversations about it as if it's honest? Because it just isn't. Well, and yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, people are going to sleep right now. What is wrong? Excuse me. I know they say, oh, well, Biden's, I just heard James Carville on MSDNC, as I call it. Ugh. Um <laughs> Uh, saying, oh, why are people nervous? There's no way Trump can win. Well, you know what? It was on MSDNC that uh, their statistician, so-called, was saying, no path to 270, no path to 270 for Trump. Remember that in 16? Yes, you I know do. That Hillary Clinton's lead over Trump was about the same as Biden's lead is right now. Who's president? Excuse me? Okay, so here's the problem. I'm telling you, again, they don't, the Democrats... Don't figure the steal. People can tell you who they're going to vote for. They don't know if their vote's going to count. And mail-in votes? Are we kidding here? Okay, I have a chapter in How Trump Stole 2020 called uh, Mail-In Madness. Now, I know you have no – okay, you have no idea how I have been beat up over this chapter because I say there's danger in mail-in voting. And people say, yeah, but, oh, you sound like Trump. He says, we can't mail and vote, blah, 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 it's fraud. No, 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 no. He's full of it. He's lying, believe it or not. Believe it or not, your president's lying to you, though there's not fraud in mail and voting. The mail and voters are victims of a crime. 22% of all mail and votes don't get counted. One in five mail and votes is not counted in America. That's not Greg Pallast. That's the MIT Caltech study of mail-in voting. They've been studying this for decades. 
22 percent, one in five mail-in votes don't get counted. Now, half of those, half of those votes don't get counted because you is because voters don't get the ballot. So as they, if you you can't mail in your vote if it's not mailed out to you. And I'm tired of people telling me about Oregon. Oregon is not part of America. Portlandia is this white little suburb attached to America where everyone gets a ballot mailed to them and everyone's ballot who gets returned gets counted and it's postage paid. It's very nice. If there's a mistake on your ballot, they will literally call you to correct the mistake. So Portlandia white voting ain't voting for African-Americans in Alabama where Doug Jones is fighting for his life for re-election. You have to – in Alabama, you don't get a vote unless they accept your excuse for not voting, which you have to su- apply notarized. You have to notarize your ballot in Alabama. Oh, don't worry. If you can't find a notary in the lockdown, you can get two two witnesses that you better qualify as active voters. That's what you have to do. To this is So mail-in voting is, is a – Jim Crow disaster that you have to notarize your ballot in Missouri, another swing state in Alabama where the Senate is up for grabs. That's a poll tax. It stops people from voting. And it's even worse in places like Wisconsin. If most first time voters don't realize that in about a dozen states, you have to mail in your photo ID the first time you vote. And in Wisconsin, there's the whole uh, chapter on Wisconsin eats its young and and how and the theft of Wisconsin 2020 two chapters. Uh, students not only have to mail in their photo voter their ID from their school, they have to include a letter, a letter or some type of proof that they are currently enrolled and in good standing. Now, if you flunk your algebra class, what does that have to do with your right to vote for president? I'm not kidding. You have to put in the Proof that you are currently enrolled in good standing to use a student ID to vote, and you have to mail that in. And let's add this. You just added two, three pieces of paper to your envelope. You better add a stamp or you're going to lose your vote for postage due 100,000 voters in 2016, according to the feds. According to the federal government, 100,000 voters lost their vote from postage due. This year, it will be a million. Yeah, I, I lived in Oregon for a while and voted there, and I understand how exceptional it is for sure. And there's no way that you would have time between now and the election to implement something like that in every other state. And as we can see from how this system works, there would be so many forces and powers at work to make sure that a uh, legitimate mail-in system would not be implemented. They would stop that from happening, it seems to me. Oh, yeah. They, they're they hostile. They don't want you to vote. And I'm, for example, I was in Milwaukee for uh, um, The Guardian and Democracy Now! And I met with one of the elections board's members. Now, uh, it's a Democrat. Understand that the Democrats took the state house. Despite, by the way, that's the good news. Despite all the trickery, you can win. The, the voters can actually choose, but you got to overwhelm the steal. So they did it in Wisconsin, despite it's one of the most Jim Crow worst states for voting in America, Wisconsin. But still, the Dems won. But I spoke to the Democratic elections chief there who's still fighting the elections rules. The Jim Crow and anti-student bias is still built into the state law that that so you got a problem. Student voter ID, 182,000 Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin students have state photo ID. Now, this law requires you to have a state photo ID to vote, but it excludes, it excludes student photo IDs. You can have a gun, you can use your gun hunting license, your concealed carry gun permit license, um, but you can't use your student ID. So they disenfranchise 182,000 students. And like I say, if you get then you can but you can go and get a special ID, but then you have to include these uh, photocopy if you mail it in with the proof of of enrollment, etc. Now, how do you get that special ID from the dean of students office, which is closed right now because of the virus? There you go. That's so they could. What The reason I bring this up is when you say there's not enough time for a change to an Oregon like system where mail-in ballots are treated 
with respect. Um, rather, you've got absolute hostility, as the elections chief in Wisconsin said, the Democratic elections chief said, why can't the University of Wisconsin simply issue proper student IDs so students can vote? And the answer is Scott Walker appointed some SOB to be the the uh, chancellor who refuses to give students IDs that would allow them to vote. It's deliberate. So it's not even enough. It's not a matter of enough time. It's deliberate blockade. The state of Alabama uh, was sued over requiring a notary or two witnesses to send in your ballot, to mail in your ballot. And a lower court, a federal court said, yeah, this is insane and a virus to make people to do this. And then it went to the Supreme Court we're five. We're the Kavanaugh Court, and you know the five uh, black-robed uh, Republican ravens. They took they took off their white hoods and put on their black uh, robes and uh, said, "No, in Alabama, you're going to have to get a notarization of your ballot." Too bad, poor folk. And where do you find the notary in the lockdown? One, well, a notary costs like fifty bucks, too, doesn't it? Yeah, so it it changes different states, but. It's, It's a poll tax that's supposed to be against the law, but they understand what they're doing. And but the media is not in America is is beginning to open up to cover this. But it's very hard to discuss race in America, as we know about from uh, from George Floyd, where the only way you get attention is if you go into the streets and bust a Starbucks window or something. I mean, it's ridiculous what it takes to get attention to racial issues in America. And you are you're correct that um, my work, so how Trump stole 2020, it's important that we look at following the money, but also following the mechanism. The rich people, the Cokes and Paul the Vulture Singh and the rest, you know what? I don't even think that they're racist in their attitudes. I don't think they have a problem with black folk per se. Their problem is the color of their vote, which is blue. And so they'll do, and they know that if you go after black people, no one's going to complain. When I uncovered the fact that 58,000 black men were denied the right to vote, being accused of being felons, the head of the Democratic Party in Florida at the time told me, I can't get a single white politician to complain about this. Because the minute that they start defending black people, saying, don't deny them the right to vote, they aren't felons. They say, well, how do you, black people, of course they're felons. They're, They're lying if they say they don't have a criminal record. They understand you go after black and brown people. No one's going to step in your way. And this is where it's not just about the people who are in charge and the people with the money, but the fact that black people are still not able to vote in the United States, have so much trouble with it, should be a huge scandal. And it isn't even among Democratic partisans. Well, here we have the problem, like, like, um, as we noted, Stacey Abrams is the first African American woman to have ever run for governorship. Now, I have a, a by the way, I have a, a in my book I include a, an interview with with her. I've been actually investigating in Georgia and working with Stacey Abrams for seven years. I didn't just arrive to do this election or even the 2018 gubernatorial election. I was hunting down that scamp Brian Kemp. I sued him well before he even ran for governor. And, um, again, to get the information, but this is, so now the democratic party loves her. The problem is not that, that no one's bringing up the issue because Stacey Abrams has formed an organization fair fight. And she hired, by the way, my expert team you'll see in the, in, in how Trump stole 2020. The problem is not that no Democrat brings up the issue. It's the congressional white caucus in the democratic party. I'm worried about. It's just that simple. You don't have many white politicians, I'm being blunt about it, taking on protection of the black vote. Now, interestingly, Bernie Sanders, I had a meeting, uh, I was uh, with um, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who has um, um, been uh, really promoting my work, and he asked um uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders to meet. He asked all the candidates to meet with me and him to go over the issues. Like at that time, we were very concerned about a system of removing voters by a guy named Chris Kobach of Kansas. Mr. Uh, if you don't remember the name, just think KKK. Oh, yes. 
And uh, Mr. KKK had a, had a vicious vote thieving system called interstate cross check that we were trying to bust. Only Bernie Sanders would talk to me and, and uh, the reverend about this. Everyone else was ducking. All the other candidates for president ducking. Sanders was there. And interestingly, I made a presentation to the Congressional Black Caucus some years ago. And, you know, you don't have to be black to be in the Black Caucus. Just like in the Irish, you know, there's an Irish caucus and very few members are Irish. It, it's, it's about the issues. There's no re- racial requirement. So I'm giving this talk to the Congressional Black Caucus, and as you might expect, it's black faces, except for one really tall white guy <laughs> at the back, kind of stooped over. Bernie Sanders is part of the Congressional Black Caucus. Oh, I didn't and know that. He, yeah, he, he, you know, he showed up at meetings. It's whoever shows up, you know, and because uh, he cares. Now, it's not that I'm not here to tell you, oh, how wonderful Bernie is and vote for Bernie. That's your business. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, really, seriously. You don't need Greg Palace to give you a to give you voting advice. I give you voting advice on how to save your vote. And by the way, this is important. I, I want to get this across. And how Trump stole 2020, it's not a prediction. I don't have crystal balls. I do have the facts, which is that 16 million people are already removed from the voter rolls. So we got, so it's already stolen. 16 million people already removed from the voter rolls the past two years. That's, again, a government figure, not a palace figure. And overwhelmingly young people and voters of color but you can steal it back that is un you know bust the burglary by well, number one check your registration right now if you're listening don't assume that you're registered just because you've been voting the same place for 10 years i don't care but at the back of the book the whole point of writing the book is to stop the steal to reverse it i don't care whether trump gets elected or not that's up to the voters but it would be nice that this time unlike 16 we actually let the voters pick the president. How about that? So at the back of the book um, is is my um, – it says Ted and Greg's new improved ballot condom, and, uh, and which gives you seven ways to protect your vote. Words, we can change policies. We can agitate. But in the end, you better save your own vote. It starts out with uh, don't just pick and lick. You don't just pick a president and lick a stamp, and that's how you mail in your vote. It, it's It's a very – you better be very careful with that mail-in vote, including such things as, as ask for it way early, way early. I know that the head of the ACLU in Georgia asked for about 45 days in advance and got it on June 10 for this past primary. The election was June 9. This is the games that they play. They don't send you your ballot. So I'm trying to tell you how to save your vote and reverse the steal. It can be done, but you have to know how they're doing it. Right, so people need to be very alert about this, and then they need to help their friends be very alert. Yes, and that's, by the way, one simple thing I do suggest people do is um, I was at a, a, a Baptist church in Atlanta, and instead of doing souls to the polls where they knew that they were going to have to wait four or five hours, they did souls to the post filling out FC ballots but the advantage was they were all together in the church they could check each other's ballots and make sure for example when you fill out a mail-in ballot the 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 most dangerous thing is the envelope you better there's all you know this in most states it's like 10 things you have to fill out make one mistake you've just lost your vote and remember in most states you have to put on that stamp and even though it has one little square most states you better put on two stamps or you're you're going to lose your vote to postage due 100,000 votes lost that way. Sign it exactly as you registered. So, for example, about a, a quarter million mail-in ballots were rejected because some GOP operative said, I challenge that signature. It doesn't look like the registration signature. Now, to me, if a signature is wrong, that's an indication of a felony crime. Someone stolen a ballot and signed it for someone. If there's a felony crime, arrest them. Don't take away the ballot. Or were there really a quarter million illegal voters? If there were, why don't you – they didn't arrest one, right? So they – but it's just cock- reasons to challenge your ballot. Now, according to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, the chance your ballot will be disqualified is 900 percent higher if you're black than if you're white. That's the U.S. Civil Rights Commission calculation, 900 percent more likely to lose your ballot, have it disqualified if you're black than if you're white. 1.9 million ballots were disqualified in precinct. 
critically 75,000 of those were in Michigan in 16. And 3 million mail-in ballots were cast, were not counted. About half of that amount, a little more than half of that amount, were ballots that were never received. And the other half were ballots that were, for example, they said mailed in too late. That doesn't mean it was mailed in too late. If you don't mail in your ballot at least two weeks before the election, assume it won't be counted. You need at least two weeks. The post office is going to implode. So you have to protect your ballot and the people you know. Right. And just to kind of wrap this up, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you said in here, and I th- near the end of your book, voter suppression is simply class war by other means. Exactly. I talk about race because that's the weapon because it's – and race is the uh, indicator of class in America. It's a general rule. And so it is class war by other means. As we started out at the beginning of our talk, what it's really, really, truly about is the, uh, is the money. They need to steal your, your government for the money. And – um, there's a scene in How Trump Stole 2020 where I tried to jump Paul the Vulture Singer, and his uh, goons grabbed me. They recognized me and grabbed me. I was in a really ridiculous disguise. <laughs> this was a funny part. And of I the do book. a lot of undercover stuff. You know, I do a lot of undercover stuff. But this was a badly put together disguise. We got caught, and my cameraman. The Academy Award nominated cameraman Rick Raleigh was filming using an iPhone, but he's clearly holding it in a way that a normal person doesn't. So we got caught. It was really bad. I don't always succeed. I, <laughs> as my, as, as Ms. Bad Penny, my chief of staff, and also now my wife says, uh, once again, Greg Palace loses the James Bond Award. So don't I, I look cool on, on camera doing all my undercover stuff, but you don't see the outtakes show you when I fail. <laughs> and, and so uh, – in How Trump Sold 22, I try to jump this guy. I get caught by his goons, this billionaire. And uh, they have these, like, Dick Tracy wrist watch communicators on. I kid you not, like little Dick Tracy watches. And so they're talking to the singer, we've got Greg Palast. And so I grab the guy's wrist, and I, and I start shouting into the wrist, Mr. Singer, how much is it worth to you uh, to buy the White House? Why do you need to buy the White House? What does it get you, right? And it's all about, in his case, um, very concerned about the taxes and on uh, their billions. God forbid. There's no sense making billions of dollars if you've got to share it with the U.S. public and the Treasury. If you have to pay tax on it, what's the point of stealing it in the first place, right? So they're very concerned about that. Donald Trump said he was going to close the biggest loophole used by uh, the financial billionaires like Singer, which is carried interest. Then they started backing him, Paul Singer, paid for the inauguration and suddenly trump reversed his position and didn't touch this billionaire's loophole it's very important donald trump is for sale for sale that's very you know this this bs that he's a billionaire doesn't care about the money nonsense he just plays a billionaire on tv and it's nonsense so it's you're right it's about the money vote theft is class war vote suppression is class war by other means exactly that's why and by the way may i invite you all on uh thursday the 16th at 7 p.m eastern for facebook live with me noam chomsky and amy goodman and the founder of of black voters matter latasha brown facebook live 7 p.m they're going to be launching and we'll discuss how trump stole 2020 just go to gregpalace.com for information or my Facebook page, Greg Palace Investigates. And you can't beat that. <laughs> Amy, Noam. You're, yeah, no, that sounds great. That's tomorrow. Uh, your your new book is, is officially released this week, right? Yes, it was released on the 14th Tuesday. Oh, okay, and, yesterday. And let, me, and let me throw in something, especially for um, – because uh, uh, Counterpunch is – one of the wonderful ways I get around and over the electronic ball, Berlin Wall, which keeps my voice out of my own country. I'm tired of being a British journalist, so thank you for bringing me my voice home. 
uh, back to America. My pleasure. And, and so anyone listening to Counterpunch, listen to me now. If you can pick up the book anytime this week, send me a, a, a screenshot or some type of photo or something, and I will send you – my foundation, my not-for-profit foundation, will send you a copy of the audiobook for gratis. Just go to gregpals.com, contact Greg, or send me the clip, send me a photo at um, audiobook, audiobook at gregpalast.com, and we'll send you the audiobook for free. Just send that snap. Because I really, you know, it's very important. And I want people to pay attention to Counterpunch, read it. Because you're, this is the news that they want to keep away from you. And it's one of the – we don't have the money, but we have the facts and we have the people. And that's the point of Counterpunch. That's a great offer about the audio book. That's awesome. I, I, I'll send you one too. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you read it or do you have someone else read it? Oh, I, I no. This I read it. I've, I've often had like you know be, oh, before good. I had Alec, Alec Baldwin and – and Larry David and Ed Asner and all these other people reading it. But I decided, nah, <laughs> because um, believe it or not, Larry David cannot read a joke. He's <laughs> terrible on screen. He can't read a script. <laughs> if he didn't write it, he can't read it. So I, I decided, well, this time I'm going to read it myself. Yeah, well, there's so lots I, of there's lots of jokes throughout. I definitely appreciated that. Like it, it never that that sort of kept it from getting bogged down at any point. Was you throw in a punchline every? Well, you know, you know what? So. Here's the thing. I wanted to make it entertaining. By the way, there's a, you should let people in on the fact there's a 48 page comic book in the middle by the wonderful Ted Rall. Oh, yeah. Uh, who I was, interviewed him last week, and we talked about that already, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And who was fired by the L.A. Times for uh, making fun of police brutality yep. in Los Angeles. And um, so, yeah, I try to make it entertaining. And uh, like Noam Chomsky said, oh, the book's scary. I said, but no, you didn't laugh. <laughs> you didn't laugh plenty. <laughs> he said, um, the idea is I make it entertaining for a reason. These vote thieves are actually, and so is Trump, these are buffoons. And I don't want to credit them by making them, you know, like, like Moriarty or some super evil geniuses that we can't overcome. So if you make them like terrible, overwhelmingly scary monsters instead of the, the evil, greedy, grasping little grifters that they are, these are small time grifters who somehow worm their way to the big time. And so I have to keep it entertaining so also because otherwise I, you, I don't want you crying through 300 pages. <laughs> 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 Laughing is better. Definitely. And so we can go find your new book at gregpalast.com. And the usual, you know, the usual suspects. So that's why if you go to the usual suspects, just send me the, the photo of it. And, you know, uh, Powell's bookstore, bookshop, go to gregpalast.com, links through to, you know, the uh, – the, the, the river company whose name I won't mention or Barnes and Noble and uh, or get it from gregpalace.com directly just go to those sources just send me the uh, little snippet at audiobooks at gregpalace.com to get that audiobook that's great thanks so much for spending some time today with me uh, Mr. Palace I really appreciate it and I thank you very much Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley New Mexico USA on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.